Let me invite you to open your Bible to the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon. If you're unfamiliar with where that is, it's right in between Ecclesiastes and Isaiah. If you're unfamiliar with where that is, your Bible probably has an index. You can look up the page there and find your way. The Song of Songs. So Solomon writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant, your name is oil poured out, therefore virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. And she says, I am very dark, but lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards. But my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon, for why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? He responds, If you do not know, O most beautiful among women, Follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. They say, we will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. She says, while the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. Behold, he says, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. And she says, behold, you are beautiful, my beloved. Truly delightful. Our couch is green. The beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters, our pine. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. It is living, it is active. Make the book to live and act in us. We pray for your glory and for our joy in Jesus. And in his name we pray it. Amen. So here we go. In what's widely considered uh, the greatest romance ever penned, Shakespeare brings together a young woman and uh, a young man from rival families, which for all its romantic intrigue is a story, if you don't know, that ends in tragedy. Uh, These are the final lines of that very great but very sad tale. Quote, A glooming peace this morning with it brings. The sun, for sorrow, will not show his head. Go hence to have more talk of these sad things. Some shall be pardoned and some punished. For never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. They were, Juliet's dad says, uh, the poor sacrifices of our enmity. And... As we scan the scene for true love today, it is tragedy that is so much of what we see. Uh, The poor sacrifices of our enmity with God. Or our ongoing battle with sin. We see the the devastating effects of the so 
called the self-titled sexual revolution, juvenile immorality, adultery, things like pornography, predatory behavior, uh, sexual slavery, all in the name of enlightened liberty. It's the air we breathe. Such that when it comes to true love, my guess is we may each carry a certain degree of skepticism, confusion, baggage, brokenness. Uh, Perhaps we expect nothing but tragedy in the end is sort of branded upon our souls, these poor excuses for love. And yet, I think, we all want to be hopeless romantics. Because something else is baked into our souls. A time. A time when heavenly love was the rule. And not the exception. And a promise, even when it was lost to sin, that it would be recovered again. That redeemed by Christ, we'd see in His people a foregoing of the world's brothels. For God's glorious designs. And if you think that doesn't sound very titillating to me, maybe put down the worldly for a moment and begin to pick up the holy. Neither Nicholas Sparks, sorry ladies, neither Nicholas Sparks nor Fifty Shades of Grey come close to the depth of delight revealed by God in the Bible in a book like the Song of Songs. And yet, oddly, it seems I have to ask, have we ever studied it? Have we ever heard it, read it, much less sung it? Can you imagine? If not, that that may actually be part of the problem. If we're little discipled on sexuality to the glory of God, something is going to backfill. Something is going to fill in the blanks. And if it's not going to be God's Word, it is going to be the world. So beloved, in the Song of Songs, we have a divine fireplace of all things rightly extolled as romantic love. It's just that it's held a a smothered fire that needs to breathe. We need to let it speak as it is the very Word of God because the song is a vivid reminder that there is such a thing as heavenly love. And that in the end, the story of the world, the story that's told in the Bible, the story, the intimacy in our marriage is meant to tell is the story of a divine romance that while definitely including tragedy, most certainly does not end there. Okay, so let's come to our text and see first the outstanding claim here that this is the greatest song. So verse 1, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. I don't think that's hyperbolic. Okay? Uh, Solomon was the wisest person, his side of wisdom incarnate, namely Jesus. He was divinely gifted. We heard it a week ago. Understanding beyond measure, breadth of mind like the sand of the shore, experience of life as rich as his riches, wisdom surpassing all others. He was a genius. Aristotle, Copernicus, Mozart, Einstein, goodwill hunting. I know he wasn't a real guy, I don't think. But they'd all blush to be in the presence of Solomon. He's the intellectual unicorn. And he liked to compose music. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, it says that he wrote 1,005 songs, which is just crazy. 1,005 songs. That's the corpus of a couple lifetimes by the second sharpest mind ever known to man. And nestled within that great corpus, one song. This song, called the Song of Songs. And so what we have before us is the greatest song ever written by the greatest mind ever given. Save Jesus. Add to that the fact that it's Scripture, that it is 
inspired by the Holy Spirit, that it is a most lovely flame then and that inerrant lamp of God unto our feet. And we should be asking ourselves, where have these 117 verses been all of our lives? I mean, you do like music, right? And you are, as I pray, a Christian. And right here, number one on God's chart, number one on God's playlist for us to enjoy the Song of Songs. And of course, as the best song should be, the song is the greatest love song. Not You Got It Bad by Usher. Not uh, On Bended Knee by Boys to Men, right? That's old stuff right there, okay? Not Rewrite the Stars. Does that one land? No? Okay. Not All I Ask of You, Phantom of the Opera. Not Unchained Melody. And certainly not your favorite country song. No, it's this song, which is Solomon's. And the love it explores, we need to mark, is Edenic love. It is, in effect, a return in some real measure to the love shared between Adam and Eve prior to the fall. Redemption is in it. Uh, You recall one of the instant effects of their sin was marital shame and strife. It was relational enmity. It was gender rivalry. It was soulful distrust. It was spousal power trips. It was a jockeying for that throne. Not exactly the heart habitat most conducive to heavenly love. That was in Genesis 2. Left behind in Genesis 3. If you want to know what so trips up our desire and ability to relate to and radiantly love one another as husband and wife, it's really, really easy. Plain and simple, it's sin. But my, how Jesus can help us there. So in the song, we see now a couple not at enmity. (laughs) We see a couple reconciled. We see a couple naked. Uh, A lot. Uh, We see a couple enamored with each other's love and completely unashamed. It's almost, I mean, you read some of it and you almost blush because they're so totally unashamed. By the way, they're generally in a garden setting. So this is a return to Eden. It's a union of hearts, a man and a woman with grace at the center. It's marriage that in all of its unchained melody sings of Jesus and His redeeming love for His bride. Which brings me to this. It's also a song of repentance. You may know this, but for all of his fame, Solomon was infamous for having at least as many wives, princesses, and concubines as songs. A thousand. And so maybe we should be looking for a more upstanding guide in the matters of true love and godly romance. But here's the thing. It's in the Bible. So the Lord picked Solomon to author the song, probably as a notice of his repentance. It's his reflection on the way things ought to be. It's his reflection on the way things should have been in his own life, but weren't. That is, the way that God has affirmed as very good And heavenly. It's wisdom, listen, from one who richly tasted all the world's romantic bounty. A thousand wives, princesses, concubines tasted all of that and said, it's all futile in the end. That's Ecclesiastes. Now the Song of Songs. The bud may have been sweet in the moment, the flower was really, really bitter. So if you've ever wondered, hear it. A word from one redeemed sexual sinner to the many. A thousand lovers is nothing in comparison 
to the divine loveliness and soulful succulence of that one flesh union, man and woman, till death do us part. The song is a notice. Genesis 2 is best. Eros, within God's ethics, that's the way to go. That's what he's saying. And so we move along in the greatest song, and what a start. If you look at verse 2. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Oh. See that the poetic theme of the first few verses is actually on the impetus behind her desire. Something's motivating this. I think it's the dominant theme of the whole song, really. It's that he has loved her so remarkably well. Do you see that? In verse 2, it's, let him kiss me. In verse 4, it's, draw me after you. Ah, Let us run together. And in between, the thing compelling her to long for him like this is how he loves her. Note, not makes love to her, but how he loves her. I've called it a Romane Conti love. If you should look at your bulletin there. If you don't know, that's a wine. And not just any wine. It's the most precious wine in the world. It was bottled up in 1945, recently sold at auction for $558,000. And what made it so precious, so costly, is that it was so rare. There were only 600 bottles of it ever filled. Point being, the way her man loves her is even rarer than that. It's more precious than that. Your love, verse 2, is better than wine. So no wine in the world rises to the occasion of his love. It is uniquely pleasurable, and we might even say intoxicating to her. And see again, the focus is not on how great he is in bed. It's on how great he is to her. The focus is on him, his aroma, his name, his character, him and his love for her. And it is the particularity, that's the word. It is the particularity of that love that really takes center stage in the song. See, in some innocent respect, I think, uh, the virgins there, into verse 3, they love him. Then you go to verse 4, the others there, they also rejoice in his love. And really what they're doing there is just echoing the bride's own sentiments. It's like they love him for how he loves her. And it begs the question, doesn't it? How does he love her? That's where we all lean in to give a listen, only to be disappointed. Okay? It doesn't immediately tell us how he's loved her. But you see, that's the genius of the whole thing. Brothers, we are not told, yeah, just uh, just do this and that and you're golden. Voila! Love! That's not what he says. Listen, rich love, rare love, heavenly love is not lazy in application like that. Romane Conti love gets that not every woman is alike. Shocking, I know. But your bride, or your future bride, is going to be unique. She's your own self. And the call then, as Paul puts it in Ephesians, is husband, love your wife. Love your wife. Explore her. You can spend a lifetime exploring her. You will never get to the bottom. Explore her. Know her. Tailor your love for her. Refine that. Make it really, really rich. Put it in a bottle. Get a hold of the wine glass of her heart and you just pour that out. Put it on a tap. The other day I asked Jen about this. So what to you is love better than wine? And it was this kind of love cluster. Hard work, tender words, 
and an embodied Christ. And I came away feeling the lesser for it. But the point is, when I sweat for her, when I take time to fashion words for her, when I give her a taste of Christ by the way I love her, which I won't specify because trade secrets and particularity and all, right? husband, go ask your wife. Anyway, all that's attractive to her. It inclines her to say, draw me after you. Let us run. And so a few words, husbands, it seems our love will be as intoxicating as it is particular. Love your wife. Not an ideal of a wife. Certainly not another's wife, but your wife. Refuse to let the love that belongs to your wife, spiritual, emotional, and physical, run off elsewhere. Resolve to give her your undivided love. Divided love, whether by lustful looks elsewhere, unwise interactions, misplaced priorities, that kind of love that's divided like that is ultimately going to be a deserted love. It's going to go dry when what you want are streams in the desert. Corral every ounce of love that you have for her. And leash it there on her. And as you do, don't do it for sex. Do it for her. The marriage bed may be in effect, as it seems to be here in the song, but it mustn't necessarily be the goal. Beloved, we need to understand that while sexual intimacy within God's guardrails is amazing, it's not, it is not everything. Do not be deceived by a culture that has begun to equate humanity with sexuality. The greatest and truest human who ever lived, lived and died a virgin. And he commended those who for the sake of the kingdom followed suit, as does Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And, just know, the day is likely to come when spouses are not able to make love. That in no way means they can't love. They can't model love. They just need to focus on the marriage, guys. And not just the marriage bed. That said, Christian spouses really should be the best lovers. All the way around. And so I say to our desiring singles, as this song will, uh, don't settle for slumming it when you can settle at banquet. So much sexual immorality occurs because we're unwilling to believe and wait for God's best. We settle for moldy cheese and stale crackers and cheap wine, and I'm just here to say, don't do it. Don't do it. Wait it out. Don't sell yourself short of Romane Conti love. Understand the dignity, particularly the dignity that you have in Christ, and demand the depiction of heavenly love that you get in the Bible, even as you're trying to develop it yourself in order to give it to someone else. You see, picking up in verse 5, uh, we're given a self-portrait of the bride here. And I love the color that it adds to her. What it tells us about her. Uh, maybe we thought she was just a beauty queen. Maybe we thought she was just a mere sex symbol. Perhaps another woman objectified. An Esther of sorts. right? A lusty dame using her physical attributes for political gain. But no. She's just a, she's just a girl. She's just a young woman in love. She's this man's bride. And she is lovely, she says. But she's more than that. She's more than physically lovely. 
that is. She's a girl of character. She's got dirt under her fingernails. Hard work in her makeup. And humility in her heart. I won't go so far as to say she's the girl next door, but she's certainly not a princess pampered in a castle either. Now it appears, verse 6, she's been subjected by her brothers, for what unkind reason we don't know, to the labors required of keeping vineyards. And that was some hard and often dangerous work. And, as she says, her body had paid the price for that. There was collateral damage. She was sun-kissed. Who wanted to be Solomon-kissed? Or whoever this guy is, right? She was sun-kissed and unkempt. She was unpopularly tanned. It's popular in our day to be tanned. Not then. She was unpopularly tanned and roughed up from overwork. She was not the cover model for the latest women's magazine. Again, she wasn't an Esther swimming in a year of beauty treatments. And yet, and yet, how beautiful she was. Underneath the dirt, what dignity. Beneath the hurt, what humility. For all the calluses and frayed edges, what complementarity, what willing femininity. Right, there's modesty and there's vulnerability and there's integrity. She is strong as she needs to be, but also willing to be truly weak. She's able to stand on her own two feet, but oh so wanting to fall into his arms. Tell me, verse 7, you whom my soul loves, where are you? I want to be with you. Where do you pasture your flock? You see, he's a shepherd king. Note that. Where do you make it lie down at noon? Tell me, for why should I be like one who veils herself looking all over the place for you? It's actually an important detail there. Why should I be like one who veils herself? Veiled women were generally immoral ones. And so what she's saying is, let me know where you are so I don't have to appear in any way immodest. I don't have to appear in any way up to no sexual good. I want to come straight to you in wide open association with you. I want all to know, as she will say, my beloved is mine and I am his. Everything right and nothing wrong is going on here. In other words, amid all of the upcoming imagery, there's not one hint of impropriety. As in Genesis chapter 2, it's all very good. They are bride and groom, husband and wife. Her desired trek to this man is no walk of shame. And she wants to avoid even the appearance of it. And as that needs to be a word for you, let it be. Dear ones, and here ladies in particular, is that your goal? Is it to sneak around behind a veil? Or is it to live openly with dignity? Is it in effect to play the prostitute? The showgirl? The girl looking for love in all the wrong places? Or is it to walk against the ways of the world as God's girl in view of attracting, if you want, God's kind of man? The kind of bait you use will go a ways in determining the kind of fish you catch. And this one has caught a shepherd king to be her sole mate. And that becomes evident as he speaks for the first time. And what we feel, starting in verse 8, is a shepherd's touch. And I'm not referring to his hands, but to his words. Here he shows men something really, really crucial. How as once said, quote, Before you touch your body, be sure to touch your heart and your mind. And so, as she longs to get to him in innocence, he tells her the way to do that. He doesn't hide his whereabouts because he's about the same things 
as she is. And a hallmark of the song, their desires match. Okay? The affection is mutual. The love is mirrored. He wants to be with her just as she with him. And so, guys, he makes it happen. He makes it happen. Her longing for him and his for her connect. And it clears a path for them to be what? Together. The rest of the day, it seems, with all of its events, is but a biding time for the main event. And the main event is the united husband and wife being united again. And speaking of that Romane Conti love, see how now within an earshot, his servant words are poured out for her. Uh, Perhaps this will apply, ladies, but she's a little insecure about her looks. A little insecure about her body. And so what does he do? He looks her in the eyes and tells her how beautiful she is to him. He titles her, Oh, Most Beautiful Among Women. He calls her, My Love. There's a particularity again. My Love. And, in an always bold move, he tries his hand at giving her a beauty comp. Uh, A Knight's Tale is one of my favorite movies. And in one scene, William, it's an illegal jouster, tells his crush, Jocelyn, that her beauty will be reflected in the power of his arm and the flanks of his horse, uh, which doesn't go over so well. (laughs) And uh, her handmaiden, in response, tries to encourage her Uh, She says, maybe where he's from, that stands for beauty. And maybe we bear that in mind here as our guy compares our girl, verse 9, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. But listen, now, if you've ever actually studied a thoroughbred, if you've actually ever taken a, a close look at those athletic runners at the Kentucky Derby, you feel the power of this compliment. He's saying she is strong and athletic and graceful. She's awe-inspiring. Honestly, she's kind of powerful to behold. That's what he's saying. And brothers, we need to see where he's looking. William, to make up for his blunder, asked his friends for advice, poor decision, in addressing Jocelyn winsomely. And uh, let's just say they had him aiming shallowly beneath the neckline in his compliments to her. Not this man, with his wife. Speaking for himself from his own reservoir of deeply attentive love, he keeps his eyes, guys, up. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments. Your neck with strings of jewels. And ladies, if you frame anything, listen. Frame your hearts and your face. Your hearts and your face. But brothers, I want us to see here how he's listened to his bride. She's divulged to him some of her insecurities. He's listened. He's listened to her. He's heard her. He's discerned her sore spots. And he's used his words to heal her. To secure her in those very insecurities. He's laid eyes on her darkened skin, her unkempt vineyard, her tired body. She's had a long day at work. She's all a mess and frazzled. He looks her in the eyes and speaks into her heart, you are the best. None is more beautiful than you, my love. That's the love that's better than wine. That's Romane Conti love at $22,000 per ounce. For her to savor, and for us brothers to develop, and yes, even put on public display. Do you see the others? The others here? Middle of verse 4. 
And then in verse 11, all they're doing is echoing what they've heard these lovers say to one another. And so the question for us is, what do others hear us saying about our spouses? We're fooling ourselves if we don't think we're setting an example that will, for better or worse, be followed by our children. Maybe those we disciple, we have them in our house. Maybe even our spouses. When I'm, when I'm rough with Jenny, she's way more gracious than I am, but there could be the temptation for her to be rough back. But if I'm gentle with her and gracious with her, that gets mirrored. Brothers, we need accountability in this. We need accountability in using our tongues to edify our wives, to secure them in our love, to put them up on a pedestal, to adorn them with our verbal jewelry, to so rightly and publicly affirm their beauty that others say, Amen. <laughs> whatever she is in the world, roughed up, vine dresser, whatever, whatever she is in the world, she's his queen. See how he loves her. See how he crowns her with his words. I'll tell you, I remember in seminary, good friends of ours coming to me after I had said something rather unbecoming of Jenny and telling me, hey, listen, man, that was not good. You need to repent. You need to repent to her and you need to repent to us because we were party to it. And uh, I did, I think. I don't know. And, and I hope I'm more like this man because of it. Guys, shepherd your wives with working ears and reassuring words. One brother put it like this on the power of this guy's words. It's as if his words meeting her wishes bring them home. Beginning in verse 12. To Eden. Think about that. Ah, gentleness. What a portal. You thought I was going to leave verse 4 alone, didn't you? The king has brought me into his chambers. Nope. Saved it for here. And the talk of a green couch. Picking up in verse 12. I asked Jenny the other day if our couch was green. She said no. It's tan. And I laughed. Because what's meant is not the color of the fabric of the couch, but the vitality of their love. Maybe she understood that. I don't know. Uh, you, you, you've broken off a branch before, right? And you've seen the, the green inside. It's vital. It's fresh. It's lively. And it's much harder to, to break off than one that's tan and dry inside. Well, they've made it home. He's on the couch what she calls, you should see, our couch in verse 16. And the scene, to be brief, because it pours into next week's sermon, is how shall we say, um, fragrant with love, aromatic of love. Here's some of the descriptions. Her nard gives forth its fragrance. He's a sachet of myrrh. A cluster of henna blossoms resting between her breasts. The point is, they're close. <laughs> uh, they are close, and they're just breathing each other in. That's the picture here. The other day, I think we woke up in the morning, and I was like, Jenny, come over here. And we just hug, and my son gets embarrassed here. He's just ducked his head. We hug, and... And I, she wants to like go off, you know, and I'm like, no, you stay right here. And I just put my face like in her neck right here with that hair all down there and just, just breathe her in because she has her own lovely, beautiful smell. And it is intoxicating to me. So, they're close and they're just breathing each other in. And then they catch eyes and there's no looking away. No looking away. Ah, oh, you are beautiful, my love. So beautiful. 
like doves. What eyes. You too, my beloved, you are beautiful. Truly delightful. And as she gazes upward, the curtains close for now. And we're left to the implication their couch is not in any way tan. It's very, very green. But folks, listen, if, if you've been married for a while and the air's kind of grown stale, learn from these newlyweds. Newlyweds, about to have a couple in here, you have a ministry. Be revived by the song. No one ever said that your covenant love for life had to live in a cold shower. Least of all, amazingly, God. No, like a, like a fine wine, your physical intimacy as it's truly rooted in depth of knowing each other should ripen and richen with age. It just begs the question though, is your love vital? Is it green? Are you as eager to serve and relish your spouse today as you were on your wedding day? Brothers, are we loving her so well that she's compelled to say, draw me after you. Let us run. On that first day, 16 years later, 60 years later, Draw me after you. Let us run. I do think that's the idea here. And that it applies not only to marital love, but to what that love is purposed to reflect. And that is the love between Jesus and His people. And you say, come on now. <laughs> that's a bit, of a bit of a stretch. There's nothing about Jesus here in the song of songs. But I assure you, there is. Beloved, the song is in the Old Testament. The Old Testament's about the Messiah. The regular way God speaks about His relationship to His people in the Old Testament is as a husband to a wife. Go check out Hosea. So that sin is often spoken of as spiritual adultery. A breach of faith in one's covenant relationship with God. And then we come back to the song itself. We should know that Solomon, as Jesus Himself says is a type of Christ. He's the greater Solomon. And that the man that Solomon portrays in the song then is also a, a type of Christ. He's the purveyor of a love to his bride that is resplendent with gospel themes. Reconciliation, security, service, grace, Covenant fidelity, soulful intimacy, heavenly love, a love that will not let her go, a love she longs to know better and better, a taste of that love, as one put it, that undergirds all of reality and in whose presence alone all longing can be truly and utterly and eternally satisfied. There is a reason Paul says in Ephesians 5 that marriage is actually just a profound mystery fulfilled in Christ and the church. And then, of course, Jesus gladly bears those titles, doesn't He? He is the servant. He is the shepherd king. He is the bridegroom. Of whom He Himself says, the whole canon of Scripture, the song included, speaks. And so there is a way to read the song Christologically that is about Christ. And it's this. It's this. Let Christ's love for you compel your longing for Him. That's it. It's as Robert Murray McShane put it about 200 years ago. It is to bask in His beams. It's to lie back in His arms of love. 
For nothing is more central to the Christian life, he says, than living in the knowledge of that love that has no height nor depth <laughs> to it. It is dimensionless, infinite, eternal. There's so much more to say there. But what has chapter 1 said to us along those lines? We've talked a little bit about a love that's better than wine. How about a love that's better than life? Because it delivers us from death. How about a shepherd king who loves for us to find him and who loves to find us even when we're prone to wander and the love is not exactly mutual? How about a groom who shed his own blood to bring us into an everlasting covenant of peace with God? Uh, are any of you feeling insecure today before the Lord? Before that judgment day? You worried about how you look before the lover of your soul? Jesus looks upon your darkness. Jesus looks upon your unworthiness. Jesus looks upon your unsightly roughness, the things you don't want anybody else to see. He looks upon your sin, even your deep sexual sin, and calls you still, my love, and oh, most beautiful. He shows you the way back to Him, having clothed you in the ornaments of His dying love. Will that not secure you? Will that not satisfy you? Will that not draw you after Him? Unbelieving friend, will you not, Psalm 2, kiss the Son, lest He be angry? I tell you, Christ is altogether lovely. Altogether lovely. He is what your soul most wants and most needs. So if you would avoid eternal tragedy, don't deny Him. Don't deny Him. Your story does not have to end in woe. The risen Jesus gave Himself up to save you from your sins. The, the, the exhortation this morning for you is to begin to love this Jesus now. And as you do, come and let us know about the wedding. Beloved, listen, are we longing for Jesus? Are we desiring the dearest and deepest fellowship with Him? Are we asking Him, praying, draw me after You. Let us run because I know I need it. I need that grace. Is He the one finally who gets us through the day? You know, I want to be the one that gets Jenny through the day, but ultimately, it's Jesus. Are we yearning for open association with Christ? No veil necessary. Is our love for Him wildly aromatic of His love for us? Confident in His grace, can we lock eyes with Him and say, You, Jesus, are truly delightful to me. Are we an echo for? Are we hot after the King in all His beauty? And along the way, are we telling the whole town about the wonders of it? About the wonders of His love? What a different story we have to tell and reflect than that of Romeo and his Juliet. We have the Bible's love song. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. And it's given to lead us to Him. And in Him, to happily ever after. Let's pray together.
Lord, we thank you for your word. Oh, please, deepen our love for you. Help us to know in an increasing way the depths of your love for us and let it draw us after you. We pray for grace to have that kind of love play out in our lives in all the ways that we've discussed from your word. We ask that you would give us grace for this, that you yourself would do it and get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.